we will keep everything moving. So hello, everybody. It's exciting to have you in class today. What a great day for everybody to come to class and learn all about national elections. What a great week to do that. It is National Election Week here at the National Constitution Center, and my name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the Center, and we welcome you all to this amazing class. And we're super excited that we have Professor Morley with us today. So Professor Morley, I'm gonna begin by thanking you for joining us, and then we'll dive in a little bit about who you are, where you teach, and kind of what your expertise are as Jeff joins us as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for um, having me. Thrilled to be here. It's awesome to have you in class today. And so I read so much about your bio and your work, and I found some amazing bullets to kind of pull out for our students. One was you're an expert on election emergencies. And if you were here for the pregame conversation, we were talking about how weather and giant storms can create election emergencies. The other thing was post-election litigation. So imagining have you always had a lot of work in that field or has that been even more in the last few years? <laughs> well, I was obviously 2020 was very unique in that regard, but right overall, right, since Bush v. Gore, there's been a dramatic uptick in election litigation. You know, what, what one scholar in the field refers to as the voting wars. And so, you know, while while the previous presidential election definitely is is an outlier, it's something that broadly speaking, over the past two decades, we've seen much more of than than you know, in the 20th century. And this is fantastic. So now I can tell the students you're also a professor at Florida State University, um, and also a really other fun fact before I turn it over to Jeff that I love: you were once general counsel for the Army. No, I was assistant to the general counsel for the <laughs> army. <laughs> I just promoted you. That's what we do. <laughs> so awesome. And with that note, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Rosen, who is our president and CEO, and we'll be asking you lots of questions, but what a perfect week to talk about national elections. Jeff, over to you. Thank you, Curry, and great to see you, uh, Professor Morley, Michael, if I may. It's such an honor to have you speak with our great students. Um, I've so uh, enjoyed and learned so much from our conversations over the years on our Constitution Center podcast and town halls, and we're really fortunate to have the benefit of your wisdom. So, so welcome. Thank you for having me. Let's use our time together to, um, as concisely as possible, share with our friends uh, the basic provisions of the Constitution that govern elections, and then maybe we can signal some of the current uh, questions that the Supreme Court is talking about. So you wrote about the election clauses for the interactive Constitution. I'm trying to screen share, and as usual, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to bring it up fast enough, but tell us what clauses you'd like us to focus on. Which one should we start with? Sure. So the Constitution has different provisions that govern different types of elections. So with regard to congressional elections, there's Article 1, Section 4, which is often referred to as the Elections Clause. And that is a sweeping grant of authority that lets state legislatures regulate the time, place, and manner of holding congressional elections. So most aspects of congressional elections. But it goes on to say that Congress, if it wants, can step in to make or alter those rules. And so you have basically two different entities, right? the legislature and then Congress, both of which have coextensive authority to regulate, as the Supreme Court said, to enact a, a complete code to govern uh, congressional elections. And so uh, historically, we've seen legislatures play the primary role here. You know, most aspects of congressional elections are governed by state law, but Congress has periodically stepped in from time to time to uh, regulate discrete aspects of the process going back to the 1870s when it established a single national uniform election day for uh, congressional elections. Before that, states had broad discretion as to when within a several month period they would hold their congressional elections. So right, even election day, what we think of as election day today, uh, stemmed in part from a, a series of federal statutes. With regard to presidential elections, the- Sorry, can I, Michael, can I just stop for a sec? Because that was so interesting what you told us and so significant that you reminded us that it's really states that have the primary responsibility for setting election rules, you, with a few exceptions, you said Congress, 
has uh, tended to stay out of things. Any other big congressional interventions we should know about? You mentioned the single national election day. Is it, is it significant that in the, was it the 1840s that the Congress mandated single member districts for, uh, and tell us what those are and just give us the highlights of the times that Congress actually has stepped in to-, to Yeah, ab- absolutely. So uh, the, the law that you're talking about, Congress enacted during the 1840s specified that that each state has to divide itself into congressional districts with one member of Congress being elected from each district. Before that, some states had chosen to have at-large congressional elections where all voters throughout the entire state would get to vote for all members of Congress from that state and congressional elections largely resembled modern day Senate elections. And so in order to One of the downsides to that, of course, is that if you had a state that was divided, say, 60-40, where 60% were members of the Democratic Party, 40% were members of the Whig Party, which was was the other major uh, political party at the time, then uh, assuming that all of those uh, Democratic voters voted for the Democratic candidates, the entire state delegation to Congress then would be Democratic candidates. Even though 40% of the state supported the Whig party, there wouldn't be any Whigs elected. And so by breaking the state, by forcing states to break themselves up into congressional districts, it created more of an opportunity for voters who were in a numerical minority within the state to at least have some representation, to give members of the other party an opportunity to at least secure a few seats, uh, representatives for a few districts. More within the 20th century, you know, one of the things we'll, we'll we'll talk about in a little while, the Voting Rights Act was obviously one of the most one of the most important statutes that Congress has enacted to reform the election process, though that applies to elections at all levels of government, you know, not just congressional elections, but pre- uh, state and local elections as well. More recently, uh, Congress has enacted the National Voter Registration Act, which uh, requires states to accept a federal postcard application there that the, that the federal government creates in order to register people to vote for federal elections. And most states generally will accept that to register you for state and local elections as well. Every once in a while in recent years, there's been a, there, there's been a controversy here or there over it. Uh, there, following Bush v. Gore in 2003, Congress enacted the Help America Vote Act, often referred to as HAVA. That is, uh, impose new minimum requirements for the statewide voter registration database. So rather than each county within a state maintaining its own records, now voter registration records had to be maintained on a statewide basis. There were provisions in HAVA establishing new requirements for voting machines. Right, One of the big, one of the big problems that gave rise to Bush v. Gore was the use of punch card ballots where you somebody would have to actually pierce the ballot with a stylus or something in order to vote for a candidate. And then you have you, what were called chads hanging down. And And so part of the point of HAVA was to eliminate the use of those sorts of less reliable voting machines, make some funding available, uh, establish the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, a new bipartisan federal agency that would uh, help to promulgate standards for states to follow to ensure the uh, to ensure that they were operating their elections uh, fairly and efficiently and using the using the uh, secure technology. And HAVA also created provisional ballots, which was one of perhaps its, its, its most practical innovations, where if there's some sort of dispute as to whether you're eligible to vote at a polling place, rather than just sending you away if, there, if, you're, not in, if you're not in their records or if their records show that you voted already, instead, election officials are generally required to give you a provisional ballot. So then after the election is concluded, then stated the election officials can then go back and determine were you eligible to vote? You know, did you already vote? Was there some sort of problem with their records? And so rather than either trying to sort this all out at the polling place and holding up the line or just sending people away, you have provisional ballots which allow people to cast a vote and then that vote gets counted if and only if it turns out they are an eligible voter who, 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 di- who didn't vote already. So the, those are those are most of the most of the major laws that that Congress has enacted. And like I said, other than the Voting Rights Act, most of those statutes deal specifically with federal elections, but states choose to voluntarily apply them to state and local elections as well because they don't want to go through the hassle, the cost, the administrative burden of basically trying to have two separate election systems. 
So interesting. That was such a great summary. And of course, I'm scrolling here from the wonderful explainer on the elections clause that you wrote with Frenita Tolson on the interactive constitution. Friends who are watching, always go to the interactive constitution and read the common essay, uh, which represents areas of agreement between our two scholars, because it'll give you the essence of the clause. And as Professor Morley just told us, here are the exceptions that he uh, talked about the places that uh, Congress has enacted statutes limiting the amount of money people can contribute, requiring people publicly disclose most election related spending, mandating that voter registration forms be made available and requiring states to ensure the accuracy. So he just um, so well summed up much of the learning here. Um, at the end of the explainer, you flag that some states have chosen to the, the, the court has held that a legislature can delegate its authority under the elections clause. And a few states have delegated their power to nonpartisan independent redistricting commissions. And then in your, uh, the, these states believe that these commissions can uh, make the electoral process more fair by preventing voters from being divided into congressional districts in ways that unduly protect existing office holders gerrymandering. Tell our friends what gerrymandering is, what the debate over it is and what the Supreme Court has held about its willingness to oversee gerrymandering. Sure. So, so gerrymandering is the intentional drawing of district lines. They might be for the state legislature. They might be for Congress, you know, for the U.S. House of Representatives. They might even be for towns that elect members of a, of a township committee by ward. It might even be just how you divide up your town into different wards. But gerrymandering is the drawing of, of district lines from members of a legislative body with a particular goal or purpose in mind. And so the two most common types of gerrymandering that we talk about from a legal or a constitutional perspective are racial gerrymandering and political gerrymandering. Racial gerrymandering was historically one of the, one of the techniques that uh, many states used to try to dilute the political power of members of racial minority groups, particularly African-American voters. And there were two main ways of engaging in uh, gerrymandering. And in, in this context, we'll talk about racial gerrymandering, what's called packing and cracking, right? So cracking is a situation where you have members of a particular racial minority group, and there's a, there are enough members of that group, and they live in a compact enough area where you could make a legislative district such that members of that group would be able to elect the candidates of their choice. With cracking, the people who draw district lines instead divide members of that group up into many districts so that within each of those legislative districts, members of that racial group comprise only a small minority and they wind up getting consistently outvoted then by a block of white majority voters within that district. And so the, and so the whole strategy of cracking is you take a group, you divide it into many different districts so that within each of those districts, it is too small to be able to exercise enough political influence to be able to elect their preferred candidates. Packing is just the opposite. Packing is where you have enough, where a members of a racial minority group, or if we're talking about political gerrymandering, it could be a, a, a political group, right? A Democrats, Republicans, whatever party is being targeted. It's where you take members of that group and you put as many people as possible into a single legislative district or a single congressional district. So even if there would be enough people in that group to ordinarily be able to influence or elect candidates of their choice in two legislative districts or potentially even three legislative districts, the point of packing is you pack so many members of that group into a single district that you dilute their you dilute their ability to to elect members of their choice. So they get to win in that one district, whereas under alternate schemes, they would have a likely chances of being able to elect candidates in two districts or three districts. And so you're diluting the the the, the extent of their political influence. So racial gerrymandering is when those strategies are used to try to unfairly and unconstitutionally dilute the influence of members of, dis of uh, historically disenfranchised racial minority groups. And then political gerrymandering is where those types of strategies are used in order to dilute or undermine the political influence of a particular political party. And so whatever, whatever party is in control of the state, 
sometimes tries to engage in political gerrymandering, packing and cracking to reduce the influence of the other party and to decrease the number of legislative seats that members of the other party can have a, have a good shot at winning. Thank you very much for that very clear explanation of the difference between political gerrymandering and racial gerrymandering. Uh, and of course, as you, you note elsewhere in uh, the Interactive Constitution essays, the Supreme Court has held that although racial gerrymandering is subject to constitutional review when race is the predominant purpose in drawing districts, um, political gerrymandering generally isn't susceptible to review by the courts because as the Supreme Court her, her held recently, uh, the justices couldn't agree on a standard for deciding when a political gerrymander did or did not violate the constitution. I wanna ask you about your really interesting uh, separate essay, Enforcing the Elections Clause by Preserving the Role of Legislatures. And since my screen is freezing, I'm not gonna be able to call it up right now, but tell us what, what question you were exploring in that important essay and, and the debate today about whether uh, state legislatures can delegate their uh, power to elect the president um, to uh, state courts and, and so forth, and, and under what circumstances they might be able to seize that power back. Sure. So I, I, I think the best way of understanding the issue is to turn to the Supreme Court case where it arose, Arizona State Legislature versus Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. The people of, Ar the people of Arizona wanted to combat political gerrymandering. They wanted to ensure that the state legislature didn't draw congressional and legislative district lines in a way that gave what was perceived to be unfair advantages to, to their political party. And so using a public initiative process where the voters themselves have the opportunity to approve or disapprove of a legal provision, using a public initiative process, the voters adopted an amendment to the, to the Arizona state constitution saying that the state legislature would no longer have power to draw legislative or congressional district lines. Instead, they created a new independent commission, meaning in, in, independent, bipartisan. It was distinct from the legislature, separate from the legislature, and it would be this entity rather than what was perceived to be the more partisan institutional legislature that would be responsible for drawing, uh, drawing legislative districts and congressional districts. So with regard to congressional districts, the issue arose, it, uh, the state's only power over congressional elections comes from the elections clause, which we had, we had looked at before. And rather than giving that power to the state as a whole, right, rather than saying each state shall determine the time, place, and manner of congressional elections, it instead singles out the, le the state legislature. It says the legislature of each state will determine the time, place, and manner of congressional elections. I like to say it pierces the veil of statehood, right? It singles out a particular entity within, within the state. And so the, the question is, did what happened in Arizona violate the elections clause? And there were basically two types of concerns that could be raised, a procedural concern and a substantive concern. From a procedural perspective, the argument was the creation of this new commission wasn't, the legislature didn't create it, right? The institutional state legislature that people voted for representatives, it convened in the Capitol, right? It, it had many members. The institutional legislature did not create this commission. Rather, it was the people through a public initiative process that did so. And so the procedural question was, when the constitution says the legislature of each state can regulate congressional elections, does that mean the institutional legislature, right, the thing that when most people say legislature, that's what they're talking about? Or instead, does the word legislature mean any sort of lawmaking process or entity authorized by the state constitution. And by a 5-4 a, a vote, right, a sharply divided court, the majority held that the word legislature doesn't actually mean institutional legislature. It doesn't mean, you know, like the Arizona legislature or the Florida legislature. Instead, the word means any sort of lawmaking process that the, that the state constitution allows. And so because the Arizona constitution allowed for public initiatives, that was a valid lawmaking process. You know, one of the one of the objections to that to that holding is that 
The Constitution uses the word legislature repeatedly. In fact, the, the, the Constitution talks about the state legislature as being in recess, the state legislature as having members, members of the legislature taking oaths, the legislature being comprised of chambers. And so every other provision in the Constitution that talks about legislatures, aside from these election related provisions, the context clearly is referring to the institutional legislature. And so the argument was, it would seem very surprising, it seems very unlikely that the word legislature meant one thing in one part of the Constitution and a completely different meaning everywhere else it was used in the Constitution. And no one ever said anything during any of the founding, the framing debates, the Constitutional Convention ratification debates to say, hey, we're using this word in two different, two completely different ways. And if anything, one of the arguments, in fact, that, that I had made in that in that case, as, 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 an, as an amicus, was that the word legislature was used in 11 out of 13 founding era state constitutions and in every single state constitution that existed at the time of the federal constitution. The legislature referred exclusively to the institutional state legislature made up of elected representatives. And so that was a procedural objection that because this commission was created through this public initiative process, rather than by the institutional legislature, its creation violated the Constitution. But the Supreme Court rejected that. The substantive objection is that, OK, regardless of how it got created, there's this independent commission now that has final authority to decide what congressional uh, what congressional district boundaries will be. The Constitution gives that power to the legislature. No one is claiming that this commission is a legislature or counts as the legislature. And so therefore, it violates the Constitution to, to allow this entity to have final, unrevocable, unreviewable authority to at least unreviewable by the institutional legislature to draw a congressional district lines. But again, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court rejected that, that argument. The court, the majority held that if we treat the initiative process as a legislature, that legislature can delegate its lawmaking authority to this commission. And so even though the commission itself doesn't count as a legislature, the, 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 the state constitution's decision, for lack of a better word, to give it the authority to draw congressional districts was fine under the was fine under the US Constitution. Fascinating. And that's such an important case and so significant that you filed uh, an amicus brief in it. I'm going to ask one other, you know, big uh, question and then turn it over to Curry and our friends who I know will have a lot of questions of their own. This question of of what counts as a legislature and whether um, state courts can enforce election rules in presidential elections that might vary with what the legislature set up was really controversial during the last presidential election. And some advocates and uh, people said that um, when state judges, for example, changed the rules for when you could read um, mail-in ballots and so forth, it was violating the power of the legislature to set the rules. Tell us about the framework for that debate and what uh, importance it might have for future presidential elections. Sure. So there's there's really two main issues that come up, and they're supported by somewhat different bodies of bodies of, of precedent. The first is because the a, a, a legislature's authority to regulate federal elections comes exclusively from the US Constitution, one argument is that therefore state constitutions can't impose limits on that authority, right? Usually when state legislatures pass laws, they, they are relying on powers that they get from the state constitution. And so therefore, if they violate limits in the state constitution, those laws are void, those laws are unenforceable. So one argument is because legislature's power to regulate federal elections comes from the US constitution, it doesn't arise in the state constitutions, a state constitution can't limit authority that a legislature gets from the federal constitution. And in another context, the, the Supreme Court uh, uh, bought into this argument. Right? There's another provision of the constitution, article five, which says that the legislature of each state will decide whether to ratify amendments to the US Constitution. 
And so when the 19th Amendment was, when Congress proposed the 19th Amendment to the states, extending the franchise to women, you know, preventing sex discrimination with regard to the, the right to vote, there were some states that had state constitutional provisions that had been interpreted as prohibiting state legislatures from voting to ratify such an amendment, from doing anything to extend the franchise to women. And some legislatures ratified the amendment in violation of those constitutional provisions. The case went up to the US Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court held that those state constitutional provisions could not limit the authority that a legislature gets from the US Constitution to ratify amendments to the US Constitution. And so you know, one controversy is, does that reasoning carry over to the elections clause? Does it carry over to the presidential electors clause? Right? We didn't talk about that before. The presidential electors clause, similar to the elections clause, says the legislature of each state shall determine the manner in which presidential electors are selected. And so this provision is understood as authorizing state legislatures to regulate uh, to regulate presidential elections. And so the argument is right, for both congressional elections and presidential elections, legislatures in particular, not the state as a whole, but the legislature is getting this authority from the federal constitution. And so there's a question as to whether state constitutions can limit that. In the Arizona independent redistricting case that, that we just talked about, that 5-4 majority of the Supreme Court rejected the notion that state constitutions were, were inapplicable. Right? The, the, the majority there held that state constitutions apply to state laws that regulate federal elections the same way they would apply in any other context. If you look throughout the 1800s, there are some examples of state Supreme Courts that issued advisory opinions where they dealt with conflicts between state laws and state statics, state laws and state constitutional provisions. And they wound up saying that the state law won out. So you'd have a situation, for example, where a state law said, as long as you got a plurality, whoever got the most votes would win a congressional election. Whereas the state constitution said you had to have an absolute majority. You had to have 50% plus one of the vote in order to win. And so the state Supreme Court said, if you have a situation where a candidate has only a plurality of the vote, but not a majority, they would be the winner under the state statute. They would not be the winner under the state constitution. The state statute wins out for congressional elections. And so there are these precedents from the 19th century. There are some congressional election contests where Congress said we're going to go with the we're going to go with the the state law rather than the state constitution. You know, by the 20th century, this theory largely fell into desuetude. You know, the Supreme Court relied on it to approve the 19th Amendment to extend the franchise to women. But after that, you you really saw it fell by the wayside. There were some opinions by some of the more conservative justices that were issued in the course of the 2020 election that suggested that they were open to it, that they were that they were amenable to that to that line of argument. The other main issue along these along these lines that arise is because the Constitution gives power to regulate federal elections to the legislature. Do courts have to be careful to ensure that what they're applying is what the legislature said, that they're enforcing the text of the statute as the legislature wrote it, rather than extrain, rather than interpreting state laws the way they ordinarily would, which might take into account things other than statutory text, like state constitutional provisions, like judicial canons of interpretation, general social values. This actually wound up being a big deal during the 2000 election uh, in the in the lead up to Bush versus Gore, where the Florida Supreme Court had interpreted, had issued a ruling based on its interpretation of some aspects of the Florida election code and a unanimous Supreme Court remanded the case back down. It said, in general, we would defer to whatever this, however the state Supreme Court interpreted state law, but because we're dealing here with state laws governing federal elections, we have to approach it a little bit differently. We have to make sure that the, that the state court was placing special attention, placing special focus on what the legislature did, what the legislature wrote. And so we're gonna send this case back down to give the Florida Supreme Court an opportunity to clarify its, its, its reasoning. And so again, there's a question that's arisen when you're dealing with state laws that govern federal elections, 
are there outer bounds? Are there constraints on how surprising inter you know, how surprising a state court's interpretation can be? Can a federal court step in to say a state court has departed so far from what a statute says, a state court has so departed from its plain meaning that rather than enforcing the law, rather than doing what the legislature said, in reality, it was actually substituting its own judgment. And again, that, that currently is an unresolved issue. It, you know, it's in tension with this general notion that usually in most cases, federal courts just re go along with whatever state courts say state law means. But you know, there's a concern. We don't want state courts to be able to potentially influence bipartisan considerations, especially if they know which candidates are going to benefit from particular interpretations. We don't want them to inadvertently have the authority to be able to effectively change the rules of an election afterwards. And so there's a question of, should, this, should the uh, federal courts impose this constraint, put some outer bounds on the scope of that interpretive power? Thank you so much for that fascinating uh, description of the debate. Friends, as you're listening to Professor Morley, realize this this has big consequences for uh, elections potentially, because it is a question, as, as Professor Morley says, about whether state courts can interpret election laws to extend ballots for reading uh, absent for receiving absentee ballots or, or how the ballots are counted and so forth, or whether they have to be much more circumspect uh, to interpret the law according to their plain terms because of the special role of the legislature. So, so big stakes and a, an unresolved debate. Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction to the many important issues raised by the election clauses and election law. And I'm gonna turn it over to Curry for some questions from our friends. That was unbelievably helpful, but also, you know, as we've been teaching this all week goes to show that elections are really complicated. I mean, we have a running joke that our t-shirt at the National Constitution Center says the constitution, it's complicated but it's good. Um, so it just adds to it. Do you think that this, because there's all of these layers and all this interpretation that can go on, you think this is some of the reasons why when something does happen and you're called in for an election emergency that people start to kind of question and worry about things because it is so unique to the community that it's in, to the county that it's in, into the state that it's in, that it's not such a simple system that we can explain how it works. Absolutely. And I mean, right, part of it arises from the fact that there are lots of aspects of the electoral process that just right, members of the public don't personally deal with. Right. So they're not they're 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 not used to they're not used to having to worry about. Right. A lot of people haven't you know, ever read the text of the election code or the text of regulations. And so what you might think the law is or just assume the law is might not actually be what the law what the law actually says. And then, of course, you know, one of the one of just the the unavoidable challenges with law is no matter how carefully you try as a state tries to draft an election code or a secretary of state tries to promulgate regulations, there will be some weird factual situation that arises that wasn't contemplated, that isn't clearly addressed by the by the by the statute, that doesn't clearly fall within precedent. And so it's it's within those gray areas then where I think number one, it, it's most it's most likely people will have a distrust because yeah, precisely because if there is if there is some wiggle room, if there isn't just one obvious determinate answer, then you're concerned that rather than doing the quote unquote right thing or the best thing that a court or whoever the decision maker winds up being might be motivated you know, by their own partisan considerations. And especially where constitutional provisions start coming into play, whether it's federal constitutional provisions, state constitutional provisions, a lot of the time you're talking about broad sweeping language like due process of law, equal protection of the laws, right, where these terms aren't obviously self-defining, where even the standards that the Supreme Court has articulated over the decades to apply them are themselves vague and require some subjective judgment calls, can require ad hoc decision making. I think it's that it's that opportunity for uncertainty and that fear that the election that the election is indeterminate, right? That that it, that they're the pre-existing rules aren't enough to necessarily lead to one obvious outcome that I think can that I think can contribute to uh, dis the hostility, the disputes, 
But I mean, part of part of the other, and again, there's more so with the 2020 election. I mean, we saw an unprecedented amount of disinformation spread over social mm -hmm. media. And, you know, one random person can spread, can literally just make up, right, a rumor, a lie, or particularly if you have candidates amplifying those messages or coming up with those messages themselves, right, especially with the with the rise of social media, right, a falsehood literally can get around the world before the truth gets its shoes on. And so one of the one of the unique challenges that we face in the in the modern internet age, right, with social media, is that, you know, a lot of what's getting people upset isn't even, didn't even necessarily happen, isn't even an accurate re reflection of either the law or the facts on the ground, that it's just rumor or innuendo or misunderstanding or falsehood. And so a lot of what's necessary to, to get the temperature down there is trying to combat, trying to, to limit that misinformation. And on the other hand, then making sure that attempts to limit and combat or respond to that sort of misinformation don't themselves turn into partisan tools, don't themselves turn mm -hmm. into ways of suppressing legitimate critiques or suppressing legitimate concerns. And you know, I think that 2020 is the, is the first election where we grappled with this as you know, a, one of our top challenges and one of, our, one, 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 one of the major issues. And certainly as we as we go forward with 2022, 2024, I know this is something a lot of election professional groups are struggling with. Certainly a lot of media experts are struggling with. You know, I, I'm a member of several bipartisan groups and commissions that are trying to that, that, that are trying to address this issue and just make sure that at least if we're going to fight about something, let's make it be a real thing <laughs> rather than a, rather than a rumor or a, or a misunderstanding or just an outright lie. I actually love that for all of our educators and our students of all ages that weaving, when we teach the election, look at media literacy at the same time and how do we teach these components as key pieces together. One of the students also posed the idea and wanted to ask you about national, um, being a national day off in a, a national holiday election day. How are your feelings on that? I mean, I think the, there. I think there are pros and cons on that. I mean, obviously, the, the the pro would be particularly for people with hourly wages, for people who have difficulty being able to get time off from work. Uh, you know, for for people who don't necessarily have much control over their schedules, it can be a help to them. Obviously, even when we have days off, there are still an awful lot of places open and they tend to be the more lower income service workers who would be the people we would most be trying to help through this. So I would question just as an empirical mm -hmm. matter, whether it, you know, how effective it would be in accomplishing its, its major goals. And one of the other major concerns, of course, is then you're raising child care issues that to the extent it becomes a holiday that schools are closed, then it could actually wind up being more difficult for, for uh, certain people to be able to to be able to vote. So at the end of the day, I, I do think it's 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 an empirical question as to whether the, the 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 potential new burdens that it would create would outweigh the the benefits that it would offer certain voters. I think that you know, rather than focusing just on election day, certainly a lot of the other avenues that over the years have been created for voting, right, like a, a, an early voting period, like opportunities for, for absentee voting, uh, you know, certainly for members of uh, pretty like disabled people, people who face physical challenges, curbside voting has become more common mm -hmm. so that you don't have to actually worry about being having to get into, into polling places. I, th I think that there are that there are other avenues that that might be more effective. But at the end of the day, I, I think it's 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 a good it's it, it's an important idea that definitely warrants very careful study and consideration. Awesome. Thank you. That was a lot of examples of different ways to think about uh, the question at hand. Uh, last question and we can wrap up and I promise we'll let you go. Um, a lot of students are energized by 16 to vote, at least in local elections. And a good point that they make is school boards. School boards is a local election that has direct impact on students' lives when they are 16. Shouldn't they have a voice in the system when they're at a certain age? Um, I find it fascinating how much it energizes 16-year-olds to talk about elections and get involved in it. Um, what are your pros and cons on that idea? Sure. Well, I, 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 I think you've, you've identified several of the pros, right? And, and particularly, to the ex particularly to the extent 
that uh, students are facing a, a, a particular policy issue with, with regard to their schools, that there's an issue of particular concern, that having the opportunity to get involved in, in school board elections or local races might be something that makes them feel empowered, that generates more of an interest in participating in the democratic process, could you know, start to establish a long-term habit that leads to overall higher, higher voter participation. And so, yeah, I think there, there are several arguments to be made in favor of it. You know, on the, on the other hand, I guess, or some of the, some of the concerns against it is that, you know, maybe the students shouldn't be the ones deciding what's being taught in the school. <laughs> maybe <laughs> to the extent that teachers are worried that, that, that the students have the, that sort of potential policy impact at, 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 at the school board that might, again, right, under, under certain circumstances, that might, that might raise some concerns. And I think overall, you know, one of the, one of one of the other p- potential issues, and you know, this is this is a more just you know, trans substantive question that it affect, affects lots of bodies of law. Like, w- what does it mean to be a legal adult, right? I mean, to to what extent, if you're going to claim the right to participate in the political process at at 16 years old, should that in does does that imply additional then burdens, right? Reducing some of the other restrictions then that that come along with 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 being you know quote unquote underage. So I definitely think that, you know, particularly as society evolves, you know, we we already saw the voting age as a matter of constitutional amendment go down from 21 to 18. I think that 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 it's always uh, it's always important to consider, you know, what what in modern society, what should the legal age of adulthood be? What should the rights of that be? What should the responsibilities of of that be? And right, that that's something that I think that is definitely a, an, an important issue to look into. Awesome. That was fantastic. And it gives us a lot of thought and even more fun homework to dive into that 26th Amendment and say, why did we move it from 21 to 18 and what was going on to be an adult at that time and what that meant? So thank you so much for class today. That was so helpful. I feel like we should do this maybe every three months just to keep preparing as every election comes up. It's because it is so complicated, so interestingly complicated. It's something we need to dive into often. So thank you so much for joining us. Jeff, thank you for asking all those awesome questions. And I'm really excited to have you both on today. Thank you. This was wonderful. And the, the, the questions were phenomenal. It's, it's, it's encouraging to see just that, that much interest and enthusiasm in the election process. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor Morley. Thanks for teaching us so much. And thank you, friends. Have a great weekend, everybody. Talk soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.